Ever since I became a Christian, I've tried to be a regular guy. Uh, yeah, I, heard, I heard that laugh. Okay. <laughs> but it is true that I'm not the sort of person that believes a Christian should uh, look different. You know, I mean, I have a respect for the Amish people, but I just don't think it's the right track that we wear a hat and have a particular uniform, and that identifies us as Christian people. I don't feel like we should be different in that way. I don't think that's what Jesus was looking for. Um, I'm not against going out and having a beer with a neighbor. I like sports, especially football. I watch NCIS. Um, in a lot of ways, I'm just a regular guy, and I like that. I, I value that. The dynamics of being a regular guy are even harder if you're a pastor. I can't tell you how many times I've been in some kind of a conversation with somebody, and it seems to be going normally. We're laughing and goofing off and stuff like that. And then I mention somewhere in the conversation that I'm a pastor of a church. And all of a sudden, I can see their eyes kind of start moving back and forth. What have I been saying? Did I say anything about sex or God? Have I cussed? You know, and soon after, in the conversation somewhere, well, you know, I'm, I'm a spiritual person. I don't go to church, but I'm a spiritual person. Now, I was in church last Christmas. Um, I, it happens all the time. So there's so many very real barriers out there that I don't want to create a new one. And maybe you think that way as well. You want to fit in. And, and you don't want people to think that because you're a Christian, you're prickly, you know, and no fun to be with. You don't want to have a holier-than-thou attitude. And in that, I'm with you. But one of the disturbing things from today's text in the book of Revelation is that we have to be different. We can't be just like the people around us. And that's the challenge we're going to have to face today. We're in week two of a three-week series on seven messages to seven churches in the book of Revelation. And there's so much material in these two chapters that we're looking at that we can't possibly deal with it all in the sermon itself. So we've given you a handout. We gave it out last week. We've given it to you again this week to give you historical background on the cities. You can do study on your own if there's something here that particularly resonates with you. But we have, there's only so much we can do as we actually present this in the sermons. As we pointed out last week, these seven messages have some commonalities to them. They're similar in many ways. First of all, they're all uh, the messages given to the angel of a particular church. That's who it's addressed to. Now, there are angels associated with nations, angels associated with people, and it seems that there are also angels associated with churches, heavenly beings. Don't know anything really about that. But what is clear also is that even though it's addressed to the angel, the message itself is to the people in the churches because all of the commands, all of the gra grammatical structure there is plural. It's for the group. It's for the people. And each message has a similar structure. So most of them begin with an affirmation to the people. I know this about you, and it's good. And then it goes into a word of correction. Generally, there's something that needs to be changed. And then each message ends with a motivation. And that motivation is always in some kind of image, in some kind of detail, eternal life, that God will be faithful with bringing his church into a new age. And so we've looked at two of those messages last week, and today we're going to look at three more. Now, the passage I'm going to read right now is a little bit long, so sit back, engage your imagination, let the images speak to you, and also listen for the affirmation, the correction, and the motivation in each passage. I'm going to be in Revelation chapter 2, 
and I'm going to begin at verse 12. That's on page 1126 of the Bibles here in church. Let's pray. Lord, help us hear your word. Help us listen, speak to us through your Holy Spirit. Help us respond, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. To the angel of the church in Pergamum, write, These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put, out, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teachers of, teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore. Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To those who are victorious, I will give some hidden manna. I will also give each of them a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. To the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like a blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling, so I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to our teachings and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except hold on to what you have until I come. To those who are victorious and do my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. They will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. I will also give them the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the church in Sardis, to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seventh spirit of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white for they are worthy. Those who are victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out their names from the book of life, but will acknowledge their names before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears... Let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In today's passage, we have three messages going out to three churches. And we can't deal with each one separately. So I'm going to deal with the first two together. And then at the end of the sermon, we'll take a look at the third church before we close. The first message goes out to the church in Pergamum. I'm going to talk about Pergamum 
and not so much about Thyatira. Thyatira isn't as interesting a city, and if you want to study more on that on your own, you've got the sheet, and you've got Bible dictionaries and a library here at church and the internet. There's plenty to learn. Pergamum was located in what we now call Turkey. And Jesus promises that Jesus begins his message to them by describing himself as the one with the sharp, double-edged sword. And the reason he presents himself to this church this way is because Pergamum was one of the few churches in the Roman Empire that had the power of the sword. They had the power to execute capital punishment on their own people. And they talked about that as the power of the sword. And they were proud of that. And so the message from Jesus is, is that ultimately the one who really has power over life and death is Christ. One of the things that's startling about this message is that twice in the message it talks about Satan. Okay? Satan has his throne there and Satan lives there. Now, why would Jesus emphasize that point to this church in Pergamum? There's three possibilities. The first is that Pergamum was one of the, church, one of the cities most enthusiastic about the emperor cult. They asked very early on to have the right to build a temple, a temple to Caesar Augustus, and they strongly enforced the worship of the emperor in Pergamum. A second reason that Jesus could speak this way is that uh, up on the hill behind Pergamum was a temple to the god Asclepius. The temple there was sort of like the lords of the ancient world. People would come from all over the Roman Empire and go to the temple of Asclepius to seek healing. The symbol for that god was the serpent. And we still have a memory of this temple in the symbol of the American Medical Association. So maybe it's that serpent god that's in mind. A third possibility is that, again, on this hill behind Pergamum, there was this gigantic temple to Zeus the Savior, and it had a large altar out on the hillside that overhung the city of Pergamum. And there were uh, smoke going up from the altars all day long. Everyone in Pergamum lived in the shadow of this temple. And so maybe it's this temple to Zeus that's in mind. Perhaps this is what Jesus means. In any case, the church in Pergamum and the church in Thyatira stood up against these outside pressures to walk into these other religions. Verse 13 of chapter 2 says this, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. Verse 19, talking about Thyatira. I know your deeds, your faith, your love, your service, and perseverance, and that you're now doing more than you did at first. They're faithful against these pressures. And in fact, the church in Pergamum stood up and were faithful to God in the face of a persecution that took the life of at least a prominent Christian named Antipas. But in both of these churches, there's a problem. And the problem's on the inside, not on the outside. Three groups are mentioned in these two churches. The group of Balaam, the Nicolaitans, and the group that centers on a prophetess named Jezebel. They may have been very different groups in the, what they taught or their... Uh, they're thinking about many things, but their impact on the church was very similar. In fact, the first two groups, Balaam and Nicolaitan, the names mean the same thing. Balaam means the Lord or conqueror 
of the people, Baalim. Nicholas means the same thing, the Lord or conqueror of the people. So these two groups had the same names, but in two different languages. And Jezebel was probably not actually the real name of the prophetess. It's a referral to an Old Testament queen of Israel who led the nation into false religion, into idolatry, and into all kinds of immorality. And so what links the three groups is that they lead to eating food sacrificed to idols and to sexual immorality. All three groups lead in that direction. That's the internal danger. And to get some perspective on that, we need to kind of go and take a look at some things that happen in the Old Testament. In the early life of Israel, in the book of Numbers, chapter 25, it's at the end of several chapters talking about Balaam. The people in Israel started, the men in Israel started to have immoral relationships with the women in Moab. And then through these relationships, these women led them into participating in the worship of idols. And so we have back in Numbers, back in the time of Balaam, through his influence, this issue of immorality and the issue of idol worship. Now, and then we go to the book of Kings. In 1 Kings, we have Jezebel, the original Jezebel. And she is leading the nation of Israel into Baal worship. Baal is a fertility god. She leads them into idolatrous worship and into sexual immorality. We go into the prophets. And although the prophets have a very broad canvas filled with issues of justice and other concerns, always in there is the issue of idolatry and sexual immorality. And then we come to the book of Acts, chapter 15. There's a brand new non-Jewish church developing, a Gentile church. Paul goes there to get the approval of the apostles and elders in Jerusalem. They do approve of this new church, and they, they, and they are convinced that this Gentile church does not have to become Jewish, but they give them a few directions. And it comes up in chapter 15. And I'm going to read to you verse 28 and 29. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. Here are these requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood and from the meat of strangled animals, and from se sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. And so now we have... Three groups in these two churches that are directly teaching against the prophets, against the apostles, and against the history of Israel. It's okay to eat meat sacrificed to idols. It's okay to be involved in the sexual practices of our community as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. Let's consider the two. First, let's consider food sacrificed to idols. Perhaps they argued it like this. Look, we know. We know there's one God. This is just a piece of wood. It's a piece of metal. Come on. If the mead has been dedicated to that idol, it doesn't matter. We know better. But the New Testament response to that sort of thinking, even though it's logical, is that meat dedicated to an idol is not a neutral act. It carries heavy implications because eating together had strong uh, implications. When you ate together, you were talking about bonding and building relationship between people. And that was also true in their thinking about idols. That when you ate at a meal dedicated to an idol, that that God would be present at the meal and you would be bonding with that God and building a relationship with that God. And in New Testament thinking, that there is that awareness that behind the idol, 
there are spiritual forces. And those spiritual forces are not good. In fact, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20, Paul calls those spiritual forces behind the idols demons. And idol worship opens ourselves up to those unseen spiritual forces. And so it's never a neutral act. We live in a physical creation and we also live in a spiritual creation. And in that spiritual world, there is no neutral territory. It's being contested constantly. It's constantly in battle. And so we need to be all in with Jesus. No compromise. No hedging our bets. And so in our context today, it means to me that, of course, we can be respectful to people who worship other gods. And I think we can take tours of Hindu temples and Buddhist temples and Shinto shrines. But I would be very careful not to indulge in a worship practice in those environments, even to please our friends. We had this problem when we lived in Japan. We went out with some good friends, the Suchitas, and we go to a shrine, and there are all kinds of things that Japanese people do at a shrine that are part of their worship there. And I felt very awkward holding my hands behind my back and, and just looking very appreciatively and not doing anything. But I feel like spiritually those limits are important. We have to be different. Now let's consider the other message. The Balaamite uh, Nicolaitans and the followers of Jezebel had developed some kind of theology that justified uh, sexual immorality. And their argument is one that we know fairly well because the Apostle Paul copies that argument in the book of 1 Corinthians. Now why does Jesus hate this kind of theology? Is it because he's against sex? No. God created sexuality. He's against the theology because it is not being realistic. It's misunderstanding the nature of the body and the nature of reality. This is how their argument probably went. Look, the body isn't sacred. We know it's just biological. Ultimately, you're going to be liberated from this body. So don't make too much out of the struggles with it. It's the soul that matters, not the body. So, you know, you've got appetites. Just fill them. It doesn't really matter. You can do anything you please. That sort of thinking, and it's equivalent today, misunderstands the nature of the body. The New Testament word for body is soma. And what it means is not only the physical body, but the imperishable personality that's linked to it. It's the whole. The soma is the real self, the whole person. Human beings don't have a body. We are a body. We don't have a soma. We are a soma. What we do to our body, we do to ourselves, to me. What I do with my body, I do with me, with the whole of who I am. And that means that there's more than bio biology involved in any sexual act. The act involves the soma, the real self, the essential part of who we are. We could consider it being body and soul and spirit. It's the whole of who we are. And that's why sex is so powerful in human relationships. We share our very person with one another. It's not just biology. Because of that, Lewis Smedes, a Christian author and ethics teacher, says this, there's no such thing as casual sex, no matter how casual people are about it. The Christian assaults reality in his night out at the brothel. Nobody can go to bed with someone and leave his soul parked outside. The demand for self-restraint is not a killjoy rule plastered on the abundant life by anti-sexual saints. 
It is respect for reality. The moral law fits the inner reality of sex. And that is why Jesus opposes this teaching, is because it opposes reality about the way we work. And so he grieves over that. And so I've got to ask the question of us. Do we grieve? Or instead, are we indifferent? We need to reject the spirit of compromise regarding the way we handle our sexuality. We're watching TV, and there's a spot in the plot where two people go into a bedroom to have casual sex, and the music changes. The music changes for us to know that this is going to be a wonderful moment and to pull our emotions along. And at that point, we have to be different. That's what holy means. Holy means to be separate, to be different. And we have to be different here, not because sex is bad, but because it's so good and it's so powerful. And the reality is, in life, statistically, over and over again, in relationship after relationship, there is a very real possibility that that night is going to do more damage than good across the lifetime of a person. We need to be different when we're staying in a hotel. We've been working real hard all day. We come in exhausted, tired. We want to relax. Will we be faithful to our marriages? Will we be faithful to the nature of reality and the way we handle our eyes, our minds, our bodies at moments like that? Some of the latest studies being done by secular, non-Christian psychologists are showing that pornography can change the brain chemistry of the person watching it. And that these patterns are ruining the relationships of couples young and old. And they don't argue this on moral grounds. They're arguing it on biochemical grounds. It's the nature of reality. The danger in these churches wasn't directly from the outside. It was maybe strongly influenced by the outside. But the danger expressed itself in the inside of the church by all the rationalizations people were making that they don't have to live differently than everybody else. And those rationalizations are everywhere in the church today. They're in everybody's life. There's no one that doesn't struggle with this. When the scripture proclaims that sex is intended to deepen the relationship between a man and a woman in marriage and for the procreation of children, immediately a hundred if, ands, and buts rise up in our minds. When someone says that there, Jesus is the one way to God, immediately there's a dozen Christian leaders that are willing to argue against that point. The danger is from the inside, not just from the outside. And we need to make a firm decision in our personal lives and in our life together as a congregation that we are going to let the scriptures define what the moral life, what the fully human life is supposed to be life and not our culture. And that's going to be defined as we get deeper and deeper into scripture. And that's one of the core values of Central Presbyterian Church is to clearly proclaim the scripture and Jesus Christ. And it's a battle, folks. It's a battle in my heart and in everyone's. That brings us to the final church, the church in Sardis. What makes this church different than the other two is that when Jesus begins his message, there is no affirmation. He cannot affirm this church because they're dead. Now, they don't look dead. They're still having their meetings. They're still having their worship services. People are still supporting their various activities, but they are dead. The Jesus that holds the church in his hands, the Jesus that walks among the lampstands that represent the church, the Lord of the church, declares that they are dead. That is the final result 
of buying into the full package of our culture, of any culture. Now, I don't mean that we're supposed to be anti-intellectual or anti-science. There's all kinds of things we can learn. We need to treat those things seriously. I'm talking, though, about values, about lifestyle, about morality. When we've come to the point that we explain away the morality of the Bible and say we can live just like everybody else and there's no problem, we have a problem. We're in danger of spiritual death. I've shared with some of you before that when we were missionaries on the field, one of the things we discovered at one point is that there were some other missionaries on the field that would study the Bible with a black magic marker in their hands. And when they saw a passage that they didn't believe applied to today or to them, they would mark it out with the black marker. When we do something like that consciously or unconsciously, we're in danger. The call for all three churches is to hold on to the essential things that came with the gospel. And actually, the essential things predate the birth of the church. It's been characteristic of the relationship of God's people to God from the very first things we see in recorded history. What we see in the scriptures is that always the characteristics are is that there is one God. This God will save us and to follow him will demand a change in us. And so we are going to end up being different. This is always there from the very start of what we see in the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. Now there's a promise that goes out to all three churches as well even to some of the people in the church at Sardis. And the promises all circle around eternal life. The, it, it circles around the fact that Jesus is going to own us before God. He's not going to deny us. He's going to say, these people are mine. To the people who hold on, who overcome, who are victorious. He talks about the fact that they'll have a special stone with their name on it. That there'll be a special relationship of intimacy with God that, that we uniquely have and that no one else can share in the same way. And it talks about authority be, being given to us, that just as Jesus has received authority, he passes on that authority to his church. And that will be part of our future as well. These are all rich ways of saying essentially one thing. To those churches and to us, Hold on. Hold on to what is essential. Be different. Your future is rich. Your future is with me. And your future is secure. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says. To the churches. Let's pray. God, we th thank you for your word. We thank you for what we've heard. We thank you we thank you that even though you have very high standards that your grace is rich and secure and you reach out again and again. So God, we invite that one more time. Again, come into us Give us soft hearts and a desire to please you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.